Today I am going to briefly share with you some principles. And you may be surprised to hear that this talk, or at least a version of this talk, I have given to communities, to churches, to political parties, and to business groups. And the principles which I'm about to put before you are applicable to all of those. And this morning, I'm wondering how these principles apply to our fraternity. Fraternity. So we'll maybe loosely call this talk the three elements for success. In any venture, with special reference to the fraternity. I am a, I'm a businessman. And I am everyone's favorite kind of businessman. I'm a winemaker. I am a winemaker. Yes, and I love you, Michelle. And not only am I a winemaker, you will forgive my <coughs> vanity when I tell you that I am a famous winemaker. And a very handsome one, if I may say. <laughs> All right, that last bit I made up. I have, in fact, been named the Australian Winemaker of the Year. My wines are served in first class and business class cabins in three airlines, they fly all around the world. I have, my wine, rather, has on a number of occasions been named the Australian Wine of the Year. The Wall Street Journal, in reviewing my top wine, which is a Shiraz, starts the review this way. Possibly the greatest Australian Shiraz I've ever tasted. This is true. <laughs> so my wine business has been very successful. My training is not in wine. I do not have any qualifications as a winemaker. My training is in theology, and in particular, biblical studies. In particular, New Testament theology. So, if we had more time, I would share with you the whole story. How I went from studying theology to teaching religious education at a prestigious Catholic boys' school run by the Jesuits in Melbourne, Australia, to returning back to the family business nearly 20 years ago, which was at that time a small winery and since my return to the winery, the business has grown and grown and grown something like 35 to 40 times with all of those awards and accolades that I referred to before. I don't tell you this solely for the purpose of bragging, but to set the scene for what I'm about to say. My business has been very successful. And when I've had cause to reflect on the reasons for the success, I've come up with three principles. Three things that were present in my work in the business that enabled it to become as successful, popular, and famous, profitable, as it has now become. <clears throat> Three things. Now you might lead a community or serve in a community. You may be, I hope, active in a parish. Maybe you have a business of your own. Maybe you're interested in politics or some other group or enterprise in the church or in the world. These principles apply for you. 
What's the first thing that you need if you're going to be successful? You need something. If I'm talking to a business audience, I call it a product. You need a product of genuine quality. You need something truly good. You need to have discovered a treasure, something fundamentally valuable, something noble, something pure, something beautiful. In my business, that was a particular wine that we make. I'm not sure if you are wine lovers, but you don't need to be to understand this story. We make a wine which is a Shiraz. It's a grape variety, a red variety, a Shiraz. And with our Shiraz, we ferment a small percentage of a white variety called Viognier. Shiraz Viognier. This is not a, a blend of wines that is original to me. The idea comes from France. We steal so many of our best winemaking ideas from the French. In a region south of the city of Lyon called Cote Roti in the northern Rhone Valley. And in Cote Roti, for centuries, on those amazing, very steep slopes, very beautiful, dramatic vineyards, for centuries, they have been making Syrah, the French say Syrah, Australians say Shiraz, Syrah Viognier blends. I visited Cote Roti in France in 1991, and I tasted these Syrah Viognier blends from Cote Roti, and for me it was a moment of revelation, because these wines had a perfume, a subtlety, an elegance, and a beauty that I had never before encountered in a wine. To smell them was like smelling roses. And then at the same time, raspberries. And then at the same time, complex spices. Beautiful spices. Yeah. Gilberto says we should be drinking this regularly at executive meetings. And when you put the wine in your mouth, when you tasted this coat roti, the very best coat roti, they had a texture which was something like silk. It was elegant, it was beautiful, it was fine. It was beautiful and it was the best wine I'd ever tasted. And very different to most Australian Shiraz. Most Australian Shiraz is bold, powerful, black colored, very strong, very warm. Very good. But these wines from Cote Roti, very different. Subtle, elegant, perfume. And as a young man in 91, 1991, I decided that if I could ever make a wine, a Shiraz, which had that degree of perfume, allure, subtlety, complexity, beauty, I'd be very happy. And amazingly, when you look at the vineyards of Cote Roti and compare them in terms of the soil, the elevation above sea level, they have some parallels to my family vineyard near Canberra in Australia. So I went back home Ah, one other thing. This is to me like a miracle. My father, the founder of our family vineyard, six years earlier, 
had planted some of this rare white variety Viognier. And his vision was to make a white wine out of Viognier. But when I came back from Cote Roti in the northern Rhone Valley, and the Viognier was about, this is the miracle, the Viognier was about to crop, bear fruit for the first time, I said to my father, let's not make a white wine, let's ferment the Viognier with the Shiraz, like they do in Cote Roti. I was a young man full of passion, full of ideas, full of excitement. And to his great credit, my father said, OK, we'll make this wine. Sounds a bit crazy, but we'll make this wine, red blended with white. Sure enough, the wine straight away, the first wine we made, review after review after review from the wine critics of Australia saying, incroyable, what is this wine? This is beautiful. It's like no other wine we've seen in Australia. See, the first thing you need, if you're going to have a successful business, a successful enterprise, is something of genuine quality, something truly good. I could never succeed in business if I was trying to sell something to people that I didn't believe in. I, I'm no good at telling lies. I can only sell to people something that I think is truly good, truly worthwhile. So it was like, and this is how the wine critics refer to it, something new, something exciting, something true and beautiful had been discovered near Canberra my family vineyard. Okay, that's the first thing. Something of genuine quality. What's the second thing? Once you've discovered that thing, that product of genuine quality, or the thing, whatever it is, of genuine quality that you've got, you've discovered, what's the second thing? The second thing that you need is vision. If I'm talking to a business audience, I say optimistic vision. Optimistic vision. If I'm talking to a church audience, I would be more likely to say a hopeful vision. Hope is a much more powerful idea than optimism. Hope is deeply grounded in our experience of God who we know is good and desires to bless us and draw us into a greater, glorious future. As Christian people filled with the Spirit of God, we have hope resonating inside of ourselves. Yes? Amen. An optimistic vision or a hopeful vision. You have to be able to see how this beautiful thing that you've discovered is going to be a blessing for others. You have to be able to envisage that this beautiful thing that you've found is going to be good for the world. And when I left my career teaching religious education at a Jesuit school, and return to the family business, my business, my father's business, was very small. But I knew that we had something in this Shiraz Viognier that was like no other wine in Australia. And I knew that if we treated this with care, we could take this gift that we discovered, the, the beauty of this wine, and it would become well known and celebrated all over the world. And in my head and in my heart, I envisaged that within 10 years, my very small little family winery would be one of the top five 
small wineries in the whole of Australia. I could see it. I knew that what we discovered was good, really good. And I could see how this new wine was going to become a blessing for the whole country, for those who love wine. It was unique. It was beautiful. It was true. An optimistic vision. Very important. I have a saying relevant to all of you that the first task of leadership is optimism. Whether you're leading a company or leading a community, and today I find myself doing both of those things, the first task I have is to believe that the future is better, that there is good things ahead. If you don't believe that there's good things ahead, you shouldn't be in leadership. The first task of leadership is optimism. So, an optimistic vision. So what's the third thing? First thing is a product of genuine quality. The second thing is an optimistic or a hopeful vision. What's the third thing that you need? If you're, to, if you're going to succeed in any venture, the third thing is maybe the most important of all. You need a capacity to communicate. A capacity to communicate. Because you may have found something genuinely good. And you might have a vision in your own heart for how this thing could become a blessing for the world. But if you can't communicate, if you can't share the genuine excitement that you have about the good thing that you've found, it's never going to go anywhere outside of your own head and your own heart. You have to have a capacity to communicate. This is what we did. I started, back to the winery again, I started to send bottles of this wine to all of the people of influence in the Australian wine industry. Wine buyers, restaurateurs, wine shops, wine writers, critics. I would send them bottles of this wine, often with a little note saying why I was so excited. Try this, I said, try this. It's like nothing you've tasted before from this country. Yeah. Not only did I send wine samples, and this is very important, I built relationships. I built genuine relationships with people of influence. That sounds a little bit like politics, maybe. We shouldn't be afraid of that. Politics is the human reality. Whenever you have two or more people together, you're going to have politics. You can't avoid politics. We've got to learn to do it better and do it under the grace of the mercy of God. Right? So I built relationships with people of influence. Genuine relationships. Which become fruitful relationships. It's not based on a falsehood. I wasn't conning anybody. The wine was beautiful. I was simply sharing with people who could make a difference my genuine excitement about what I had found, the beautiful thing, the noble thing that I had discovered in my family vineyards when we make this blend of Shiraz and Viognier in those soils, in that climate. Three things, brothers and sisters in any venture, something of genuine quality, an optimistic vision, and a capacity to communicate. Hmm. I'm running out of time. You can apply these three things to all any area of your life. 
But I am wondering, in this noble gathering, how we apply these three principles to the fraternity. Here's my question. What is the gift? What is the treasure? What is the beautiful thing that is the heart of the fraternity? We have to believe, we do believe, that it wasn't simply Brian Smith and Bobby Kavnar's crazy idea. We believe that it was an inspiration of the Spirit of God. It was a gift from God, the fraternity. That the Lord was raising up communities through the world. Lay people, families, married people, sometimes together with celibate people in one community, charismatic community. Beautiful things, new things in the church, almost a new way of expressing our Catholic faith. All over the world, spontaneously. It's still happening, brothers and sisters. It's still happening. The Spirit of God is still stirring the hearts of men and women who've been touched by the power of the Spirit, drawing their hearts together because they understand, we understand that God's idea is a body idea, that together His presence becomes manifest through us in, in a body. Yeah? It wasn't Bobby Kavnar and Brian Smith's crazy idea. It was an inspiration from God, the Holy Spirit. What is the gift? What was given? We have to know what that is. We have to celebrate what that is. If we're going to be what we're supposed to be, the fraternity of Catholic charismatic communities and fellowships, we have to know what the gift at the heart of our fraternity is. What is it? I ask you to reflect on this question. What did God give us? Now, in the executive, we tossed this around. And we came up with some ideas. This isn't an authoritative final list. It's some ideas. I'd be very interested in hearing what you think. But we thought, when asked the question, what is the gift at the heart of the fraternity, the true, good, noble, beautiful thing that we have received? We thought, well, it's a fraternity. It's a communion of love. A fellowship. It's a fellowship for the encouragement and mutual support of Catholic charismatic communities across the world. A coming together of people moved by the Spirit, communities moved by the Spirit, into a genuine, loving, supportive, encouraging fellowship. Very important. We have to be together in this. We have to learn from each other. We have to support each other. Learn from each other's mistakes. Support brother and sister communities who are going through their own difficult times. Anyone who's been in the community, in any community for more than six months, knows that you go through difficult times. That after the initial romance of the beautiful idea, there can often be a disillusionment when you come up against your own sin and struggle and the weakness and struggle of your brothers and sisters. It's God's beautiful idea that in our human weakness, we struggle. We make mistakes. We get our structures wrong. 
Communities need each other to support each other, to be a genuine fraternity. What else? Well, secondly, and it is the second thing, not the first thing, that by being a member of this fraternity, members join an association of Christ's faithful of pontifical right, directly recognized by the Pontifical Council of the Laity. So, in a formal sense, being a member of the fraternity places member communities at the heart of the church. That through the fraternity, the church is saying, this is authentic Catholicism. What you communities experience, the way you pray, the way you sing, the way you live, the way you minister, it's authentic Catholicism. Being in the fraternity places us as communities at the heart of the church. That's a gift. The third thing we thought of when we tried to answer this question, what is the gift at the heart of the fraternity, the true, good, noble, beautiful thing that we have received? This is a bit more recent, this interpretation, but you will respond to it well, I know. That in union with the Holy Father, in the fraternity, we member communities are an instrument for sharing the baptism in the Spirit with everyone in the church. As our Pope Francis has called us to be. That we are instruments in the hands of the Lord, corralled, called into service by the Holy Father himself to take up this commission which resounds from him to take the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Spirit, to everyone in the church. How is that going to happen, brothers and sisters, if we don't have communities of people who are working together to bring this beautiful gift to the church? It's so powerful. The potential is enormous. And I'm sure in the design in the mind of God and certainly in the mind and heart of Pope Francis to take the baptism of the Spirit to everyone in the church. Communities, not only the communities, we know that, but certainly the communities are going to be frontline soldiers for the Lord in this regard. We are well placed we are well placed to be his instruments for this commission. Take the baptism in the Spirit to everyone in the church. That was just our reflections. Three things. A communion of love. A fellowship for the encouragement and mutual support of Catholic charismatic communities across the world. Being at the heart of the church. This is authentic Catholicism, brothers and sisters. We're not some fringe group. We are at the heart of the church. The church embraces us through our membership in the fraternity. And we are instruments for the baptism in the Spirit, for taking the baptism in the Spirit to everyone in the church, fulfilling, living out the Holy Father's commission to us. Okay. Right. What about the second part? What's our optimistic vision? I'll try and do this very quickly. Thank you, Jean-Luc, for your patience. What is our hopeful vision? Having discovered this treasure, what's our vision? How can the fraternity increasingly become a blessing for its members, you, and for the whole church, and indeed for the world? Well, we need to actually be what we said in that first part that we are. We need to actually be a communion of love, a fellowship for the encouragement and mutual support. 
We need to have relationships with each other. We need to have our young people moving through different communities and coming back inspired by what the Holy Spirit is doing around the world. And I still remember with joy and gratitude when I was a young man in 1985-86 visiting the Emmanuel community in Paris, visiting a subsequent finish, visit in 91 with my new bride, visiting the community of the Beatitudes and seeing amazing communities that God had raised up and coming back inspired about what was possible. What was possible? We need this cross-pollinization between our communities to encourage one another to build each other up. I want to go to Latin America. I want to see what those brothers and sisters are doing in Argentina and in Brazil, Chile, Peru. So much power there. I want to see that. I need the inspiration to bring back to Australia. I need us fraternity to be a communion, a fellowship of brothers and sisters with open doors and open hearts to each other. Amen. 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 So let's become what we say we are. Let's celebrate the distinctive charism of each community. Let's share our difficulties our strategies, our resources, and learn from each other. Let's deepen in an energized Catholicism, drawing from the richness of our great tradition and engaging with the amazing prophetic voice of our Holy Father. The Holy Spirit is working so powerfully can you feel it in the world? It's like something is coming to birth, something new. And the Holy Father can see that. He can see that. He wants the doors open wide to the risen Lord. He wants everyone to come to know him. His hope, I can hear it in him, is that all will be saved. We're caught up in that. To make Jesus known and loved. To share together as communities, sometimes maybe works of evangelization and mercy. To work together. And not just with communities. We have Michelle Moran here and Aresta from the ICRIS. And we're very excited about our partnership, which is strengthening and deepening with Charismatic Renewal Worldwide. That we're not anymore about protecting our patch. We're not anymore looking inward. We have open hearts. Open hands. The graces that we receive so abundantly from the Lord, we're giving them away. We're sharing them. That's his intention. That's the gospel way. What else can we do? What, what else can you envisage? potential for the fraternity is enormous. We have something like 120 communities, some of them small, some of them massive. All that experience of the Spirit. So much learning. So much learning. I'd like to see the fraternity publishing works of theology. Tell me, who is better positioned in the church to theologize about marriage in the power of the Spirit. We've been trying to live this for 35, 40 years. We understand that the call to holiness is not just for priests and religious, that all of us who are baptized, who've been fused into Jesus in his dying and his rising, who've been filled with the Spirit of the living God, all of us are called to the life of holiness as married people, 
as family people. Who knows that in the church, if not us? Who is better positioned to theologize, to write about this, to reflect on it, to share this powerful thing we've discovered? Who better than us? I'd love to see the fraternity publishing theology. But what about in my community, as in many of your communities? We have married people, families, as well as priests. We have our own order, the missionaries of God's love. Priests, brothers and sisters, living in community together. That's amazing. Who's writing about this? This new thing the Spirit is doing in the church? If not us. <sighs> so much. Okay, quickly now to finish. What about the third thing? Our capacity to communicate. And as always, brothers and sisters, this is where we fall down. We've found something. We've been given a great treasure in the fraternity. By the grace of God's Spirit, we have vision to see how this thing can grow, become a great blessing for the church and for the world. We have to communicate. We have to get better at sharing our excitement about the treasure that we found. Now, whether that's through new media, social media, new strategies, new enthusiasm, new confidence, all of these things, we simply have to get better at sharing how excited we are about what God has given, the new thing that he's doing in the world today. Three things, brothers and sisters, that you need. Something of genuine quality, an optimistic or hopeful vision, and a capacity to communicate. Three things that we need. Amen.